Jingi walla blagami a rakul dukun. Jendamani nyali garaman nyali nya. Nyali nya nyathan nyathan jem. Garaman nyali chugun gunu. Wana jang ma mala gunu. Gala chugun. Nyali nya chugun gunu. Bugu be blagami. G'day everyone and welcome to the Byron Bay Writers Festival or at least an online version of the Byron Bay Writers Festival. My name is Benjamin Law and I'm really honoured and grateful to be talking to you all here today um, from Gadigal Land, which is part of the great Eora Nation. First, First Nations Australians like the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, like the Arakwell people uh, where Byron Bay holds its Writers Festival have been telling stories and sharing knowledge here for tens of thousands of years, the oldest continuing civilization the planet's ever seen. And I'm very grateful to elders past and present that we can continue sharing stories and knowledge here on what is and will, what will always be Aboriginal land. Our guest today is an award-winning writer, editor and educator of Maninjali, Young and Bear and Dutch Heritage. Their work spans fiction, poetry, and nonfiction. And their first book, Heat and Light, won the David Unipen Award, the Dobby Literary Award, and the New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards Indigenous Writers Prize. And they now have two books of poetry, the first one being Comfort Food, and the latest one being Throat, which is already the recipient of the inaugural Quentin Bryce Award. Ellen Van Nieuwen, welcome. Hi, Ben, how are you going? Yeah, really, really well, thanks. It's such a good, um, such a great kind of opportunity to chat face to face, even though it's digitally. Now, Ellen, we're talking mainly to high schoolers um, today who are still at school. And I want to take you back to when you were a high schooler. And I want to know, when you were their age, what were you reading? And did you already know that you wanted to be a writer? Hmm, great question, Ben, to kick us off. I just wanted to acknowledge um, the lens that I'm on at the moment. So I live, as you know, Ben, I live in Brisbane or Mianjin on mm -hmm. the lens of the Turbul and Yagara people, and that's where I grew up. Um, but at the moment, I'm on a little one-week break um, just off the coast of Brisbane on Minjiraba, North Stradbroke Island. So I want to acknowledge Kwandamuka elders, past, present and emerging, and just thank them for this beautiful country that I'm on today. The, the ocean is just there, you know, I, a beautiful whale watching spot like Warren Bay itself, you know, I can see whales coming through my bedroom. So I'm really stoked to be here and to be talking to you today. Um, so going back, um, I grew up in the you know, northern suburbs um, of Brisbane and I went to um, Albany Hills Primary School and Albany Creek High School. Um, and my love of reading really came, I really have to acknowledge two women for my love of reading. And the first one being my mom, who was a very beautiful, creative soul who always in encouraged me and my brother to just kind of make fun out of just like nothing, you know, mm -hmm. like just like um, we were just like, go and like make stuff and, and do stuff. And she always took us to the library um, and really like fostered a love of reading. Um, but also my grade one teacher goes right back to grade one, um, Mrs. Grenville, uh, the like the best teacher I ever had. Like she set a high standard, like grade one. Um, she acknowledged that I was, I, when I was younger, I was, um, people don't really, wouldn't really see this as, you know, me being a published writer and me being um, kind of going on to graduate from university. But I was kind of, I had a lot of learning difficulties when I was younger. And uh, stuff like reading and writing was actually quite difficult um, when I was younger. Um, I had this, I had a lot of kind of, had to do a lot of physio around just doing stuff like tying my shoelaces and um, just like really kind of stuff with my hands. Mm. Um, and so I had this teacher who gave me some extra support. So she was my grade one teacher, but then she gave me some extra support in grade, grade two, where we would do um, reading, we would read and do writing in um, 
the in my breaks in my in my lunch breaks um and she uh showed me this beautiful book um by sally morgan which i'm sure you'll be aware of ben and maybe some some of you are aware of too uh called my place mm. um which was published in i think the late 80s and what i had what miss grenville gave me was a uh, a children's version of that that book, um, which is age appropriate for me as like a, I guess a six year old. And she was like, um, what I want you to do, Ellen, I want you to create your own book, mm. um, like my place. So, and so I did a little drawing of like my house and my school and um, my mother and my brother and my dad and, that was the first time I, I did a writing exercise and I wrote a little book and I remember um, going home and saying to my mum, I want to be a children's book author. So, <laughs> um, yeah, really, when I reflect on that, wow. Like, So I knew I wanted to be a writer at a really, really young age. Mm. Um, and so I used writing as and reading as a means to... Um, kind of build this imagination I was such a daydreamer um and also just to you know I didn't particularly high school I found primary school was uh pretty okay but when I went into high school there was that kind of real you know there's bullying there's like you know like there's a lot of kind of stuff that that goes on that that made me feel very vulnerable but I used um reading and writing as a sort of an escape of that. And I used to write little stories um, in the back of say like my bass book Mm. or something, you know, I always had, I still do this. I always had like the front half of my book for schoolwork. And then like the back half, I was like doing little comics and doing little drawings and, and writing little stories. Um, And so it was very clear to me that that's what I wanted to do um Mm. and then when it becomes clear to you that this is what you want to do with your life and with your work because of course writing is work how Mm. do you how do you approach it like what were your first breaks into the industry and how Mm. did your first book heat and light come about so my parents um supported me to uh put an application into uh, QUT, which I, I think that's probably when I, I first met you, Ben, because I think you were at QUT, maybe tutoring at a, a, sim- a similar time. Um, so yeah, I put in for QUT. it's our alma mater. We share that. <laughs> yeah. Put in for QUT. I had to um, put in a portfolio, actually, of um, some of my writing. Um, it was a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree, so I was very um, concentrated on the craft of writing, um, and that so that was three years of uh, learning about the the craft of writing. Very much focused on fiction. I don't think we did uh, much about poetry. I think there wasn't a, a unit about poetry at the time, so it was. I was sort of really interested in writing fiction um and I have like my culture behind me you know I have and I have a a long kind of legacy of people in my family that have done really amazing things and um part of university was finding out about all of the First Nations writers before me and Mm. reading First Nations writing you know apart from Sally Morgan which I read in grade two but the first time having access to this um, amazing, um, very vast um, literature by Aboriginal people that is very, most of it is very connected to political movement and to agency and to protest. And so when I was at QUT and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander unit there was called the Uduru Nunapul unit. I was, um, I wanted to know, I, I was learning more about um, Auntie Uduru Nunapul, who's one of um, 
a very amazing pioneer. That's that's a bit of a weird word. A very amazing, strong, deadly woman who mm. carved the way for so many of us. Um, started off writing in the in the sixties, and her po- first poetry book sold ten thousand copies. Um, she was extremely popular. She was a conservationist. This is her country that I'm on today. Um, we made a couple of trips as a student body to the island. We did cultural camps. There was Arnie's that came in. Um, I was in the Uju unit when uh, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd delivered the apology to the stolen generation. Mm. I, as a young person, I was witness to the, um, the complex mix of emotions that that apology brought. Um, because uh, a lot of the women in the room didn't feel like it was enough um, Mm. and it didn't take away the pain of the past, but it was, it was an acknowledgement um, and it was a a truth telling moment Mm. um, with more what this country needs. So as a young person, as a young 18, 19 year old, um, I was part of this uh, group of young people, older people, um, I discovered I was learning more about my culture and more about myself and positioning myself, you know, what do I want to do? And I, and what really came into mind that I wanted to write fiction about my lived experience as a queer Murray mixed race. My dad's Dutch, my mum's Malanjali, Yugambe, person who grew up in Southeast Queensland and has ancestral ties to Southeast Queensland and not just to write myself, but also write um, older characters, gen- generational characters and the intergenerational connections between characters. And so that, that kind of idea then became Heat and Light, mm. um, which I started writing right at the end of my university degree when I was 19, 20, and finished writing when I was about 22 years years of age and um, I was aware of this opportunity called called the David U. Nippon Award where where there's this canon of black writing and uh, without that award I wouldn't be anywhere because it gave me something to aspire to and I wanted to be part of this um, you know this body of, of black writing that had inspired me so much so um, I actually entered the award in 2012 and was highly commended. Um, and then I entered again in, in 2013 and that was the year that I won. Mm. And that's how Heat and Light came about to yeah. be published. So contract involved with, and as well as prize money. So yeah. Mm. And, and now since, since Heat and Light has come out, you've had um, two more books, um, both poetry and I'm, I'm wondering because you write fiction you write poetry and of course you write non-fiction too um do you have different writing processes when you approach each of those kinds of craft or is there something similar between the modes in which you write yeah absolutely i feel like there's like multiple answers to this question but i'll just say um definitely there's a diff- different approach um, but also, I'm very interested in the in hybrid genre and the idea of like breaking down those barriers of like you know what's poetry, what's novel, what's short story, you know uh, what's nonfiction, what's fiction. I mm. feel like there's really interesting work that's in the intersections of that. Mm. Um, so I will say that uh, even performance and poetry, and um, you know, right now I'm, I'm I'm working on a play that could be poetry, it could be performance, it could, it's, it's all connected. Um, and so I think uh, I'll say that writing my first fiction book required a lot of work in immersing myself in fiction. So I read so many novels, I read so many short story collections. Some of them were required reading for my uni degree but most of the work that influenced me, I sought out myself. 
Um, so I, that was part of my apprenticeship, I guess, to like then write a, a, a hybrid fiction uh, text. Hidden Lights could be a novel, could be a short story mm. collection, sort of. Yeah. And when I started writing poetry, I had to read a lot of poetry. Yeah. I think you've also, in some ways, reminded um, people who want to be writers that mm. homework never stops. And in fact, yeah. you need to assign your own homework. You need to find out what's missing from the homework that's given to you in order to become the writer that you want to be. Hey, Ellen, we're going to wrap up soon, but I, I do want to ask you, when you operate as a writer, obviously the things that will motivate you are to write a good story, to write a good poem, to write a good body of work. But is there also beyond that a mission statement that drives all the work that you do? That's really, that's a really good question. I feel like, um, you know, three, I have three books now. Throat has just come out, the third book. Thinking about the fourth book. Um, I feel like all my work is... Um, us is, is answering the same questions. Um, one of those questions is how do we live now? How do we live as people that have been colonised, living on um, land that has been stolen, um, constantly having to uh, fight for everything, put ourselves forward as, you know, we're still here, we're still, our culture's still here, um, having to 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 uh to yeah so it's resistance i would put my writing in a in a resistance narrative box you know that's everything that i'm writing is about um asserting myself uh as a, a young queer not so young anymore I'm <laughs> but, hey you're talking to someone older than you but go on young queer black person gender queer person um really writing myself in into uh the gaps i guess of of, of the broader literature so yeah. no matter what genre and i'm i'm going to keep writing um about those same things i think yeah mm. but we're going to finish off with you uh performing a poem for us but before we do do you have any parting words of advice to anyone who wants to be a writer perhaps maybe wants to become the next ellen van newman Mm, yeah, just, you know, I said before, read, find your thing, find what you're really interested in, what inspires you. It doesn't necessarily, um, you know, just kind of expand, expand your reading, expand, and don't necessarily think just writing, think, uh, you know, go to an art gallery, go watch a film. I've, I'm very inspired by films. I, I watched this beautiful film last night mustang and i woke up oh that is an amazing film isn't that incredible um so i just woke up with ideas you know because i think that's what a, a good film a good art piece of artwork can do um so yeah kind of uh and just you know just keep keep going um there's so many other things we could be doing than writing um, especially, you know, in this world that's like, you know, social media, the internet, um, so many distractions. But um, if, if, if it's something that you're passionate about, make space for it, you know, every day or every week. Mm, that's great advice, Ellen. Uh, now you're going to leave us with a poem from your latest book, Throat. Can you tell us about this poem um, before performing it? Yeah, I wrote this poem, um, I think it was the 40th uh, anniversary of Mardi Gras a couple of years ago. Um, what year was that again, Ben? I'm just, I'm just assuming oh, that you're like... Look, look, time has melted for me. I'm like, was that even Mardi Gras this year or the previous <laughs> year? Um, but you're right, it was, a, it was a major anniversary year recently. A couple, couple of years ago, let's yeah, say 2017, right. 2018. <laughs> anyway. Um, Maeve Marston asked me, who's the director of uh, Queer Stories, which is a great uh, series of, you know, queer writers, queer people. Um, and a really good podcast if anyone wants to check it out really too. Good podcast, great listening. She asked me to write something to, um, to I guess, celebrate this significant anniversary. Um, and I really wanted to write about us as blackfellas, um, 
write about, you know, to honour queer black people um, that have come before me and are, are still, you know, and have yet to come, you know. Um, and I also wanted to, it's called the only black queer in the world because I feel growing up, I thought there was no people like me. You know, I think that's that kind of thing growing up in like a suburb that's very, um, you know, very kind of oppressive. I just thought, you know, like, oh, there's no, no one else is queer and Aboriginal. Like, it's just, I'm just on my own. And then of course, you find community and you find visibility and you realize that there's, you know, um, uh, thousands of people that are just like me. Uh, so it's also a bit part of my, my journey as, as a queer person and coming out. And so I'll just read it. Um, and when I was writing it, I was listening to Prince. Um, I love that there's a soundtrack to your poems as well. Um, <laughs> the most beautiful girl in the world if anyone wants to listen to that after this. Okay, the only black queer in the world. I was the only black queer in the world. I had many difficulties. I didn't know how to tell my family. I hadn't seen Stephen Oliver, can't even on black comedy yet. We hadn't watched it together over dinner. TV didn't save me. I hadn't seen Electric Fields perform in a sweaty old meat market with a group of friends who had similar feelings. I hadn't heard Zachariah's deadly voice singing Nina. I hadn't yet read Lisa Blair and cried sitting on the carpet in the library over sharply written work that spoke to me and my experience. I started a blog. I got many comments. People were always asking me what it was like to be black and queer. I hadn't yet started thinking about gender as a colonial construct or, examin or examining my, I my ideas of masculinity and femininity. I hadn't yet realized that my relationship was interracial. I started another blog, thoughts about interracial queer relationships featured. I hadn't yet got a crush on KMT and listened to her track that samples cold chisel. Will your cruel attitude last forever? I wondered if my parents would ever accept my future partners, if I'd ever get the chance to legalize my relationship, have children, ask for more, not for less. Some nights were really lonely and I created Kathy Freeman as a lesbian and Prince as an Aboriginal. I got trolled, deleted my social media accounts, and the only known evidence of black queer existence was destroyed. I hadn't yet seen the doco on Uncle Jack Charles and met black queer elders who knew of a previous time Australians had to vote on the rights of a group of people. They, these elders knew what it was like to hear their rights discussed by people outside of their group. I hadn't yet been to Mardi Gras I saw the white gaze and the white gaze I was used to. And then I saw black queers everywhere and every conversation was an insight into a black queer past, the street becoming a site of multi-time, the past present beat, the future love and 40 years of black queer pride spread into more than 60,000 years of we have always been here. My dance joined a big dance. I saw a Rajari Yorta Yorta lesbian couple who had been marching since the beginning, who chanted stop police attacks on gays, women and blacks in 1978. And they told me off for knowing nothing at all. Every chant is a line of a continuing poem and I'm learning the words. I saw the flag sparkle I saw gays from everywhere, from Maury to Perth. I saw a black Captain Cook, Malcolm Cole in 1988, the year of the first Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander float. That float should have been the first float that year, but mob didn't open the parade until 2005, when Auntie Karen Cook and Auntie Lily Shearer walked out each with a coolerman of curling leaves, smoking the parade. 
A small leaf fire was started in the corner of Liverpool and Elizabeth Streets, and in parade time, it never stopped. I thought properly about what it meant to be marching on stolen land, and that Roger Mackay in 1982, when he carried the flag in the march, made the point that the Sydney Gay's Golden Mile was the unceded land of the people of the Eora Nation. It was armoured of community and belonging white queers craved and this influenced how they made their scenes. I woke up on a mattress in a queer share house from a text from the other black queer asking me to go on a date. I consumed black queer art and I created it. I saw Barkindji artist Raymond Zader's work at the Art Gallery of South Australia and I cried. I felt the heavy loss for all the ones killed, murdered, missing, for the erasure of black queers in every capital, every small city and town in Australia. And I told myself I was lucky to have stayed alive and I counted the times I thought I would die. I began to know the stories of more and more and more black queers who had died. I know them now as ancestors. Every chant is a line of a continuing poem and I'm learning the words. I read Natalie Harkins, Yvette Holtz, Mayuka Gorries, and Alison Whitaker's writing online and in bookstops. I saw love for black queers everywhere. Outside the city, the sky sent me hints. The walks on country along the river kept me safe. I saw the colors of my own heart and they were not the colors of isolation and fear. Thank you.